The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Yaron Brook Show on this Monday night. Third show in a row. Trying to compensate you for my absence uh, last week. All right. So, uh, yeah, a lot to talk about today. Uh, Maybe a lot of short topics, but um, uh, a bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about the situation in Australia with Facebook and Google. I promised my Australian friends that that I would do that uh, the other night. So uh, I'm caught up. I think I kind of understand the situation. Uh, in Australia, so we'll, we'll we'll see. And if there's anybody from Australia on the super chat, you can um, you can let me know if I'm wrong. Thank you guys. Thank you for the uh, super chat contributions. Without even without questions, so I appreciate that. Of course, if you got questions like Daniel has, we'll get to those first. When you um, uh, when you I hurt your ears. How did I hurt your ears? Oh, I'm yelling. I'm sorry. The volume's too high. See, I keep. This is what happens. You know, on Zoom, I have to have the volume high, and on this, I have to lower the volume, so it's like, sorry, uh, hopefully this volume is better. This is not quite as loud, so uh, I apologize. All right, Um, so I forget, uh, yeah, I was busy, so I apologize for starting the show late today. Uh, I got caught up in something. I'm not going to tell you what it was, because it's embarrassing, but uh, I got caught up in something and couldn't leave, Uh, and... Uh, yes, I did not adjust the volume. I did not adjust the volume in time. All right, so we'll talk about Australia. We'll talk about what's happening with Facebook and Google in Australia and how that bodes ill for the United States because it is, um, it is you know, the, the headline uh, in one of the uh, in editorial page of the Washington Post is Australia showing the U.S. how to regulate Facebook and Google. So... Uh, everybody's watching. Everybody's watching to see how this uh, how this works. Um, let's see. Well, yeah. If you lower the volume, that's fine. But if it clips, some people are saying it was clipping. That's not good. All right. We're going to talk about racism. I, I want to make one simple point about racism. Um, hey, Rez. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Corey. I mean. Thank you. Uh, uh, happy to do this. And you'll tell me if I'm getting this right or not when we get to it. So I, I want to make a quick point about racism uh, to put some of the stuff that's going on. I mean, racism is the issue of our time, the issue of our time. It's everywhere. It's constant. Um, it's, it's a big part of this cancel culture that we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, so I want to I make this point about racism, and we'll see where that takes us. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of the discussion, and of course, I'm eager to see if you guys have questions about these things. Um, so, but I do want to start with um, uh, admitting that I was probably wrong on Saturday. So it's been pointed out to me that I uh, am wrong about cancel culture, and that maybe some of you on the chat were actually right about it. And that I was wrong about it. So, you know, you don't see many people willing to admit that they're wrong. But on this show, we do this uh, periodically. And uh, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. Um, culture is used. I think the point being made on the chat and the point made to me outside of the chat is that cancer culture assume, assumes that people have power over you. That is, it assumes people have power to have a, 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 a dramatic impact on your life. So when I throw somebody out of my house because they're an Nazi or communist, in a sense I'm canceling them, but not really. If I got them fired from their job because I didn't like their politics or I didn't like their philosophy, that would be more like it. If I had cultural influence where the people I was opposed to were being kicked out, then I would be canceling them. So I probably misused 
um, cancel. I think somebody said you're shunning them. You maybe I, I'm not. I mean, I still like the word cancel, but I get what you're saying. So when everybody gangs up, I mean, this is the challenge, right? When everybody gangs up on um, J.K. Rollins because she's the argument is she's transphobic or she's she's what called a feminist who hates men so much that she hates women who become men because they're becoming men and she hates men. Now, that's the theory. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I buy it. I don't get that from reading her essays. But the point is when they try to cancel, they're trying to stop people from buying her books. They're trying to destroy her. And of course they can't. So they're trying to cancel her. But in the case of J.K. Rawlings, they actually can't cancel her. In the case of New York Times commentator reporters who say the wrong thing, tweet the wrong image, or something like that, uh, they're very successful at canceling them in the sense that they get their jobs, they get fired from their jobs, they get, uh, you know, in, in, they get uh, uh, within the culture that they live in, they get shunned. Uh, they get ignored, they get people, people, uh, you know, uh, uh, behave uh, uh, really badly towards them. So I, I accept that. I think, I think you're right. I think there's a difference. Um, and uh, so I, I withdraw my use of the term cancer culture like I did on Saturday. And we will refer to cancer culture as... Now, but this can go both ways, right? It's not associated with any one political side. This could be conservative canceling a leftist if they get them, or another conservative, you know, uh, uh, the Trump mob canceling a, a never Trumpo or something like that. If they actually have the cultural power to actually cancel them, to actually inflict the pain, I, I'm sure they try more often than they're, than they're successful. And of course, most of the canceling is being done today is this, I don't think the show is starting and stopping. I think it's, I think it's fine. Uh, I think the left has all the momentum because the left has the cultural high ground, but also because the left, I'd say two things. The left cares. The left is engaged. The left uses social media. And the left is going after its own. The left is cleaning house. The left is primarily going after, not all, exclusively, but J.K. Rollins, Leftist. Uh, the guy at the New York Times who had to leave, leftist. I mean, um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Scott Alexander that I talked about the other day uh, voted for uh, Elizabeth Warren. So uh, the leftist cleaning house, they're getting rid of anybody who's not the politi you know, political correctness is like an old term, but is not fully committed to the latest latest bulletin from the uh, critical race theory police. They're not completely aligned. They don't have exactly the right language. They say the wrong words and what? They are fired. They are, uh, they are uh, attacked on Twitter. They are denounced in front of their friends. They are crushed. And of course, uh, this is a good opportunity to talk about Gina Carano. Um, because, as you know, Gina Carano, who is an uh, actress, I, I'm not familiar with her because I don't watch The Mandalorians. I guess I should. Um, I've heard that she's either very good or very bad in The Mandalorians. I, from, I got those opinions from two objectivists. Um, so she, she was fired by Disney um, because of a series, because of, um, I mean, she was like on warning before because she had tweeted stuff about transgender and other, and I'll say something about transgenders in a minute. Um, and she was uh, ultimately fired because of a tweet she put out, um, a, a, you know, a, a week ago, a few weeks ago, whenever it was. Uh, there's a date here, but I can't, I can't really see it. Um, here's the tweet. I'm going to read it to you. Well, maybe I can show, well, can I show it to you? I can probably show it to you. If you wait a second, I will, I will show you the tweet. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is the tweet. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. 
job's good enough. There's the tweet, Now I'll, I'll move it up to show you the image in a minute. Jews were beaten in the streets, not by Nazi soldiers, but by their neighbors, even by children. Uh, and she quotes, because history is edited, most people today don't realize that to get to the point where Nazi soldiers could easily round up thousands of Jews, the government first made their neighbors hate, hate them, simply for being Jews. How is that any different from hating someone for their political views? And, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to become the Nazis when you're talking about these things because I don't think you, you gain many points and you immediately antagonize people. But the point she's making is a point that says we should stop hating people because of their political views. It, and it goes, by the way, both sides. Um, but then she puts this image here, and this is where I find the tweet objectionable. I don't, I don't think she should be fired for this, but I find the tweet objectionable. This is the image, right? It's not just an image of hatred. It's not just an image of hatred. This is an image of, of a horrific um, uh, uh, attack, brutal, physical attack. This is not even cancel culture, where you've got the power culturally, but it's still basically influenced within a voluntary system. This is kids with clubs beating up a woman, ripping her clothes off. Who knows what they're doing to her afterwards? This is not, this is not appropriate in this context. So I think if just a tweet stood, you could say, okay, I mean, she's making a point. You might disagree with the point, actually, because you might say it's fine to hate my political enemies. But to compare canceling, which is, I think, vaguely what she's trying to do with this, that's where she loses me. That's just wrong. That's in poor taste. It's 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 completely it's it's not anti-Semitic. I don't think that's the issue. I think it's that it's it's just detached from reality. It's not connected to what is really going on. Oops, sorry. It's this is physical violence that she's illustrating with. I mean, it's fine to hate your neighbor. Uh, nothing against hate. And, of course, hating someone for their political views goes both directions. I mean, God, you've been on the chat here. If I say leftist, I mean, they all come out flowing and they get apoplectic and they go nuts. <laughs> I say I'm pro-abortion. There'll be a bunch of people in the chat who are going to go nuts. Right? And start hating me. But hating is not the same as physical violence. Even canceling, as much of a negative phenomena of it, that it is, is not the same as that photograph, is not the same as that picture. Um... I be, so Anna writes, I'll just take this because it's on topic. Why are you only defining cancer culture now? Lots of us were trying to say last year that we didn't want Biden only because it would bolster cancer culture. I talked about cancer culture most of last year. And I admitted earlier that I had defined it wrongly. But I spent all summer talking about BLM, talking about riots, talking about Antifa, talking about race, racism on the left, talking about uh, white, uh, what was it, uh, fragility. I did whole shows about these topics. To argue that I have not addressed these issues on the left is evasion or uh, e e being um, lazy. And I think, so give me a break, Anne. I've been talking about it constantly. Now, the idea that I don't know how evil the left is, is bizarre. And again, evasive. 
and wrong. I've been arguing that the left is evil all along. I've always been anti-left in everything. Now, I view politically, in terms of the long-term political sanity of this country, I believe that Trump was a bigger threat than Biden. That has nothing to do with my view of Biden and my view of cancel culture. I think the only chance we have at defeating cancel culture, at working at this, at changing the culture, at actually creating an opposition to Biden and cancel culture was to defeat Donald Trump. That as long as Donald Trump was in power, there was no way to fight against cancel culture. Because he symbolized the fight and discredited it completely. Because he has the same mentality as they do. Among many things. And I'm not going to get here into why I think Trump is as bad and as evil as he is. But before you go accusing me of not talking about cancer culture or not uh, supporting Biden because I love the left or whatever, do your homework in terms of what I've actually said. I hate the left. I want to defeat the left. The only way to defeat the left long term was to defeat Trump. I wanted Trump out of the White House in order so that we can together defeat the left. With Trump, we would never defeat him. That's my argument. You don't have to agree with me. Very few people agree with me. That's fine. I'm used to it. I'm also used to being right. But I'm used to people not agreeing with me. Right? I don't care. I don't think cancer culture is a new thing. Um, McCarthyism was cancer culture. I mean, in a sense, wasn't that cancer culture worse because it was uh, instituted by government? Uh, I think that cancer culture has always been around in a variety of different guises, on a variety of different political fronts. I think it takes on a particular visible and a particularly obnoxious uh, guise because we can see it on, on social media, because we're all involved, because it's visible, it's much more visceral um, because of social media. But I do think cancel culture has been around. I think that the, the, the intellectuals in charge uh, have gone, there have been phases where they have gone after people and cleansed institutions from people they didn't like. I mean, that is the argument Hollywood makes about uh, uh, McCarthyism, that the communists were kept out of Hollywood. But the truth is, the truth is that for, for, for decades and to some extent to this day, it is conservatives and, and libertarians who are being kept out of Hollywood. They used to be a, um, they used to be a group of, um, uh, of uh, conservative and libertarian filmmakers in Hollywood. They used to get together on a regular basis until they were outed uh, and canceled. That is, the group had a dissolve itself because now it was a secret group and it was infiltrated and 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 the list of names was was, was they were, the, the fear was that it would be distributed and therefore they canceled they got rid of the group that was cancer culture and that's that's been many years now uh, you can ask mark pellegrino about this friends of abe from abe lincoln friends of abe it was called i went to an event with thousands of people a lot of actors and directors and producers that you would recognize who at the event came out as conservative or libertarian, but it was a secret, and they tried to keep it a secret after the event, and a lot of people who were cameramen and all the rest. So th that idea of destroying people, destroying their careers, not giving them an opportunity. I mean, what did, what did um, here's another example. This is a, a very a direct one. What did... Um, William F. Buckley do to Ayn Rand, if not cancel her? And I have the power to do it. Cancel her from the entire conservative movement. 
Yes, yeah, so Corey's absolutely right. He says, wasn't Ayn Rand a victim of this? Yes, she was. That's the kind of canceling with power, with the ability to destroy. Now, she wasn't completely canceled because she had something to fall back on. But so have a lot of these people. You could say Barry Weiss was canceled for the New York Times, but she fell back on, she's got a substack now, and she's probably doing very well. So no, all I wanted to do today was clarify that I, that I probably misspoke yes, uh, two days ago when I said, like, I cancel people, everybody cancel, canceling is all over the place. No, canceling has to have some power behind it. It has to have some ability to impact what happens to you in a significant way in your life. And I acknowledge that I was wrong. But to say that this is the first time I've talked about it or to say that I haven't addressed it or to say that I... I, I, I haven't been attacking the left and I've suddenly discovered the left is evil is to ignore the work that I've done over the last 20 plus years, including the work I did last summer where I week after week after week went after the left. Anyway. Let's see. We've got some high-priced... Uh Let me just, are people who want destruction not consciously aware that that's what they really want? How could a group of people equally unconsciously aware of their own evil organize in such an efficient way like the Nazis in the New York Times? Well, they're conscious of particular goals. They're not conscious necessarily of the ultimate goal. They think, they convince themselves they convince themselves. And I haven't, I haven't finished talking about Carano, so I, I'll have to get back to that. They convince themselves that they're doing it for Germany, of the Aryan people, of the greater good, the greater good of society, the, the, the well-being of the human race. They're getting rid of rats. That's what they associated Jews with, the Nazis did. If you've seen the propaganda movies, of the Nazis, there's, there's one famous propaganda movie where the whole movie just shows rats, but the commentator over it is talking about the Jews. They think they're ridding society of a pest. They don't think of it in terms of, I hate mankind, I hate reality, I hate life, I want to destroy all. They think of it in terms of, I'm a good person. And I am trying to rid the world of evil. They create a story for themselves to hide their true motivation. And think about it, tens of millions of people, well, probably not all in most and accepting of a philosophy of nihilism, but what they were accepting of a philosophy of collectivism, they were accepting of the philosophy of nationalism, they were accepting a philosophy that they could not make up their own mind, that they needed a leader to tell them what was right and what was wrong. They needed to follow orders. They needed to do their duty. That's what they were convinced of. And the fact that their duty involved destruction, but it was for a, a, a higher good, for something better. Now, the leadership, deep down, were nihilistic and hateful and and and... And they capitalized on the awful philosophy that the people had. And they used. They didn't say, let's go destroy. They said, let's go fight for Germany. Let's go fight for the Aryan race. Let's go maximize social well-being. Let's do this for the common good and the social well-being of people. Right? That's what they preached. And that's why anybody who argues for sacrifice in the common good, is to be feared. You need to run away from them. All right, um, Gina Carano, back to Gina Carano. Anyway, so as you know, she put out this tweet. I think it was, a, I think it was an awful tweet. I think the picture, I mean, the, the content is not that bad, but the picture with it. Now, she works for Disney, Disney is the squeaky clean, doesn't like controversy, left of center company. 
that has a reputation. She knew who she was working for. Now, I don't think the tweet justified firing anybody, but Disney's not my company. Disney has their own considerations. And if you work for Disney, all of you listeners who either work for Disney now or will work for it in the future, beware. Disney is known to be, you know, very sensitive about these things. It's image. And its image is soft left. Not too far left, but soft left. So if you're going to be controversial, you're taking a risk with Disney. That's just the reality. It's who you go to work for. If you, if you, you know, when you choose an employer, and hopefully you're in a position in life where you get to choose your employer, I don't think Disney is woke. I don't think they're all the way there. But they're certainly further along in that direction than many other companies. And you just have to be careful. I mean, Scott says, start your own global media empire. I guess he's making fun of my claim that they're a private company. But yes. Yes, because the alternative is that the government should tell Disney who they can and cannot fire. And I guess you lovers of capitalism and freedom would prefer that. Right. That's the solution. Let the government tell Twitter who they can include and who they can't include on their platform. The government should tell Disney who they can and cannot have as employees, what movies they can and cannot make, maybe. I mean, we should replace, the, we should w replace management of Disney with the government. Really? Is that what we want? In the name of capitalism, we want to give government more power? I tried to define cancel culture at the beginning of the show. Uh, it's not a formal definition. I haven't, I haven't figured out a formal definition. But cancer culture is a, is a culture in which the, the, uh, those who have power use that power to destroy the lives of those that they disagree with, those that offend their sensibilities. Not just say, I don't like you, go away, but actually actively engage in the destruction of people. And in some cases, I don't think they're wrong. I, I, I do not weep for Alex Jones being kicked off of YouTube. But it's a question of what kind of culture do you want to live in? We talked about this on Saturday. Do you want a culture that has a very narrow, only this is permitted culturally, not legally, culturally? Or do you want a very wide? And I think you want a pretty wide You want a pretty wide definition of what is acceptable. Now, again, not legally. Legally, it's free speech. But culturally, there should be some views that are just unacceptable. But most views should be fine. And let the marketplace of ideas play out. Again, but there are limits. There are borders. There are ideas... It should not be part of it. All right. We've got 160 people watching. We've got 60 likes. Let's get that like number up. Don't forget, if you do not subscribe to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Let your friends know to subscribe to the channel. Let's get the subscriptions. We're, we're shooting for 25,000 um, soon. Sooner the better. So let's, let's try to ramp up those subscriptions. We would really love to see that. Um, and uh, let's see. Yes, and of course, don't forget to support the Iran Book Show. You can do it on Super Chat right now. Um, right here, we have already left a, a pretty good start with the Super Chat. Uh, you can uh, make a contribution. You can ask a question with a contribution. Uh, if you ask the question, uh, I'm more likely to, um, to answer. The, the, that is, the more dollars you put to the question, the more likely it is that I will answer your question. So please use the Super Chat. Um, 
liberally, liberally in the classical liberal sense, not in the uh, monopolitical liberal sense of uh, in the United States. Uh, those likes should be over 100. Come on, guys. Just, just click on the like before you leave. All right, let's see. Uh, let's talk about uh, what's going on in Australia. I, I think it's interesting. I, I've read like four articles about this. I'm not a world expert on it. Uh, there's probably more subtleties here. But Australia, the Australian government, thank you, Adam. That is, uh, that is uh, really, really uh, generous. Um, the Australian government, like most governments in the Western world, are very concerned about the power that uh, Facebook and Google have, and particularly in shaping the media message we all get. Uh, their concern is also the fact that journalism is in trouble. Uh, a lot of journalistic institutions, a lot of newspapers, a lot of media companies are shrinking. And in particular, they are shrinking their pure journalists. People are not interested in news. People are interested in commentary. And commentary, of course, doesn't require facts for most commentator. The people who actually go out there into the field and get facts, the journalists, they're just fewer and fewer of them. Fewer and fewer of them. And, you know, one of the, one of the sad things about what's going on in the New York Times is that the New York Times is one of the few institutions that has journalists all over the world trying to put together data. Now, the problem is we can't trust them anymore because they've lost a sense of objectivity. But there are not a lot of organizations that have anybody out there just getting the news, just getting information. So it's sad that the few organizations that are out there are losing money. The New York Times is making a lot of money these days. It's quite profitable in spite of what Donald Trump kept saying about them. They're actually quite profitable. Um, but they're so biased, it's hard to take them seriously. And, and of course, there are no replacements. Media, real media companies, again, not commentary, not Tucker Carlson. The people who produce the news that Tucker Carlson can comment on. There are few and few of those people. And one of the problems, that one of the observations that the government of Australia has made and the European Union has made and some people in the United States have made is that we have these massive companies, Google and Facebook, for example, that consume news, if you will. In other words, they don't directly consume it, but they, well, Google does, and we'll talk about that, but they make it possible to distribute the news that is the news, the distribution networks. They distribute it by people sharing and people liking and people, people actually grabbing these news stories from the news websites and then sharing them. But, and, and the news is being read on Facebook's platform, not in the original uh, you know, page of the news organization. And Facebook sells advertising on the page where the news is being read. And the newspaper that produced the news is getting, in Yiddish it's called bubkis. In other words, nothing. Right? So that's the situation we live in. And it's not a situation we should ignore. It's a situation with consequences. It's a situation that if you care about journalism, if you want to see more journalism, if you want to see the news media thrive, not shrink and disappear, it's an issue. It's an issue that people need to figure out how to solve. The question is who should solve it, not whether it should be solved. So what you have is Google and Facebook making a huge amount of money off of advertising on news stories that are produced by other people. And the news media is not getting anything in return. It's not getting anything in return. Now, there's a lot of ways in which this could be solved. 
free market ways. News organizations could say, you can't share this. We won't give you access to share it unless you give us a cut of the advertising revenue. The news organization could say, we're putting all our news behind a firewall like the New York Times does. And people can share it, but they can only share the headline. They can't get the story unless they pay up. Uh, so, and, and companies like Apple, the way they solve the problem is, at least a partial solution to it, is that they go to news uh, organizations and they say, we will carry your news on our Apple News app. And we will pay you for it. Or we will share the revenue from people who subscribe to the Apple News app. Right? So Apple is providing news organizations with revenue, although there's, there's a lot of complaints that <laughs> Apple, being Apple, is keeping most of it. But that's the marketplace. That's to be negotiated. And indeed, I think the New York Times, because it wasn't getting as much revenue as it would have liked from Apple, has withdrawn from Apple News. So if you go to Apple News, you're not going to get stories from the New York Times as part of Apple News. But these are all solutions that are, that are emerging in different ways in the marketplace. Again, the New York Times is super profitable. And it's put its entire newspaper basically behind a firewall. I believe that the Wall Street Journal is profitable. It too, you can't read the Wall Street Journal unless you buy a subscription. And if a, if a, if a, when you share like a, a, a Wall Street Journal article, you don't get the article, you just get the headline. Substack is the same way. If I share a Substack story, you're only going to get the top of the story. You're not going to get the part that is only for subscribers. Okay. So there is, uh, what a female says, an unbalanced relationship. There's an unbalanced relationship. There is, uh, Google and Facebook have a lot more money and in a sense have a lot more power than other entities. Somebody says, is Facebook a monopoly? No, there is no such thing as a monopoly unless it's granted by the government. What makes Facebook a monopoly? It has 20% of the ad revenue, I think, in Australia. Uh, Google has a lot more of that. Um, it offers you, the customer, a product for free. What is it monopolizing? What is it monopolizing? Um, Twitter is competition. There's this new, this new app, app called Clubhouse which is competition. It doesn't yet have a revenue model, but it'll develop one in its competition. Right? What is it about Facebook that makes it a monopoly? Nothing. Zero. Zilch. It dominates the Facebook-like social media, okay? But it created that space. And if it did it without government help, without government support, without government subsidies, without government protection, why is it a monopoly? It's a good competitor who beat the competition and dominated the field. That should be celebrated. Facebook didn't do anything to Paula. I mean, you could argue that uh, Google and Apple did something to Paula, but not in order to defend Facebook. And Paula will come back once it figures out its hosting and everything else. There are other solutions in the marketplace that we have. But it was all market-driven. And yes, there might have been government influence in the background. That's a whole other topic. But then what you should be accusing, what you should be blaming is the market influence, not and the threat that uh, Facebook faces for antitrust and the threat that Google faces for antitrust and the threat that all these companies face from government regulation, the fact that governments are regulating. That's what we should be complaining about. And then, yes, when you have this threat, when you point a gun at a company and then tell them, ooh, you better behave, then they are going to behave. But that's not because they're a monopoly. That's because the government is pointing a gun at them. Paula is back. I tried to access Paula through my app and I couldn't. But supposedly Paula is back. It's hosted on a different 
a cloud web service. Uh, hopefully, it will build a robust network that will allow people to use it, in spite of the fact that some people don't like it. I don't know that, uh, you know, that Paula is a cancel culture phenomenon. I mean, we can, the whole Paula issue is, I think, a separate issue. Um, let's see. Paula is a competitor. Yes, you're right. Paula is a competitor, for example, to Facebook. And there are others. There's Minds.com. There's, there used to be Gab. They're still around somewhere. There are others. They're just not as good. It's just not as good. But uh, uh, David says, Paul is back on the web version. Apple, Google won't allow the app back on their stores. But I have the Paula app already. Why won't it work? Even though I can't download it, why won't it work on my computer? If I, if I delete it, then I can't get it back. But if I have it, all right. Where was I? Australia. So that's the problem. That's the issue. Facebook, Google, news media, and the relationship. And as I said, there's been negotiation. Now, countries are concerned about this. So what countries, what governments are trying to do is force, and I emphasize force, Google and Facebook to pay for the news that they use. Uh, and that's what Australia is trying to do. So Australia had a commission to look into the monopoly power that Facebook and Google have. Again, I don't think they have monopoly power. I, don't th I think that's a false definition of monopoly. I think monopoly should only be used to refer to a government-granted government granted monopoly. The fact that Google has 90% of search, I don't know how much they actually have, but let's say 90%, that does not make it a monopoly. I don't think, I don't think Standard Oil was a monopoly when it had 93% of the oil refining capacity of the United States. Those are not monopolies. There's no such thing as a monopoly in a free market or even in a semi-free market. Monopolies are government creatures. The post office, that's a monopoly. Market share does not denote monopoly. Government power, the use of a gun, the use of force, that is what denotes a monopoly. No, you can say bullshit, but that's not. You know, as, as, as an economist, I can tell you that's not what defines monopoly. And indeed, there is no definition of monopoly based on market share. How much? 50? 70? 90? What's the market? How do you define the market? Is it the market for search? Is it the market for online advertising? Is the market media? Is the market social media? BS. No force is being used. No force is being used. No coercion is being used. So, no, uh, these things are not monopoly. Uh, there is no objective definition of monopoly. This was a big issue for Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand considered the antitrust laws to be the most evil laws that were passed in the United States, the beginning of the end. The, the, well, not the most evil laws passed by the United States, but the beginning of the end of economic freedom in America. And she has a whole essay on how non-objective, non-objective antitrust law is. Anyway, we'll go back, backwards. So this is the challenge, Australian government. It wants to rein in the power of these companies. And it wants to save its media companies. And they, have, they don't know how to do it. So they have a law now that they're passing, which is very complex and have multiple provisions. 
that is trying to get Facebook and Google to negotiate with the publishers. But if they don't succeed, the law creates a commission. And this commission will force, force again, Google and Facebook to pay for the news organizations. Now remember, the news organizations voluntarily give the news to Google and Facebook to share freely. Now, part of this, part of what Australia wants is that Google, if you search, let's say you search, um, I don't know, Australia, Facebook, Google, and news articles come up in the search. News articles come up in the search. And they want Google to pay every time those links are clicked on. And now that's ridiculous. The whole point Google says is these are not sponsored links. These are not paid for links. This is just a service we provide people searching. You can sponsor a link on the side. You can pay for certain search words. And there's also something called Google News. So what Google is doing is it has decided that preemptively, before the law is passed, it is going to negotiate with media companies in Australia to pay them to include their news stories, not in the search function, but in special sections of the website, including Google News, which is focused on news, where you can we just get the, the, the daily news come, up, come out. And they signed, they signed a, a big deal with News Corporation, the, the corporation that owns Fox, uh, but it also owns 50% of all the media in Australia is owned by News Corp. Uh, this is uh, Murdoch's company. Uh, but it also includes the Wall Street Journal, which is owned by Murdoch. And it, now they've got a deal where they will pay News Corp for it. And they're signing deals with other media companies. Who are they not going to sign these deals with? They won't sign them with very small media companies. So what this will ultimately do if they're forced to do it is destroy small media and, and give a huge priority on Google News, on, on these news features, to the larger media companies. And they'll relegate the smaller media companies to, 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 to a lower place. And not because of this as a market phenomenon, but because this is what the regulation basically forces them to do. Now, Facebook has decided that it does not want to do that, that it is that this new law that Australia is thinking of passing is bad, that they object, uh, that they want to protest this. And what they've done preemptively is that they are now not allowing Australians to share Australian media on their Facebook pages. So in a sense, they're restricting the ability of Australians to use, to share news. Completely within Facebook's right. Uh, I don't think Australians are gonna be happy about it. I think they'll either put pressure on the government to drop this bill or they'll put pressure on Facebook. We'll see who breaks first. It's not gonna be consumer friendly but it's also not going to be government friendly. And again, we'll see who breaks first. Um, there's already, so here's how fans solve this problem. Like, cause this is big in the European Union. Germany had a bill, had a law that tried to solve this problem, forcing Google and Facebook and other social media platforms to do certain things. The European courts ruled it unconstitutional. Uh, France has done it this way. What they're doing is they've got a special tax on social media. They've got a tax on social media. They take the revenue from that tax and their money goes to media companies as a subsidy. Now that's horrible on multiple fronts. It makes media companies beholden to the government. The government gets to decide who gets what. The government gets to decide who's good media and who's bad media by subsidizing it. It's 
an awful, awful solution to it. Australia is trying to not tax the companies and redistribute the wealth. They're trying to force the companies to negotiate. And when they won't negotiate, they'll have a committee that decides what the fee should be. Central planning, regulation, controls, always backfire. The result is always worse than what they're trying to fix. They want their cake and eat it too. They want social media. They want the media. And they want the kind of media and the kind of social media that they prefer, not the ones that evolve through the marketplace. Microsoft is, I, Microsoft is probably not exempt from this, but Microsoft is a small player in the space. Indeed, one of the reasons I think Google... So in Australia, my understanding is Google opposed the bill but succumbed and negotiated these deals with the media. Microsoft supported the bill. They supported the bill because they figured it would hurt Google more than it would hurt them and they might be able to buy, get, some, get some market share as a consequence. This is the problem. The problem is that when government starts doing this, when government starts controlling these things, when it starts intervening in this way, you form pressure groups, different groups form, who have different interests, and they start fighting. They start fighting. So let the market work. Let these companies figure it out. That's my view. So I'm curious. Uh, we've got a bunch of Australians who usually are listening. I know Corey was here. Of course, Troy uh, is, is Australian, and he's been very supportive of the show. I don't know if he's on live right now, um, but he's been on. I'm curious to find out on the chat maybe um, if my interpretation of what's going on in Australia is right and if my position on it makes sense. Uh, so I'm curious to find out from the Australians, if we have Australians here, um, if that is, uh, that is true. Uh, Jimbo says he's Australian. Uh, did I get it right? Did I describe it right? Did I, you know, am I on the right side of this issue? Um, all right, let's see. Somebody asked, why do you think many people are so hostile to market? It's not a super chat question, so I'm not going to answer it. I'll just tell you that if you want an answer to that, um, look for a video that I've made. There are many, many versions of this, but, but look for videos that I've made. Um, look for videos that I've made called The Mall Case of Capitalism. So in that, I talk about why people are so hostile to markets. Right. All right, I'm curious about uh, Corey because Corey is the one who prompted me to do this. Maybe, maybe he's not uh, listening live anymore, so I'm, I'm curious what Corey thinks. Uh, if I got this right or not. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll uh, jump in in a minute or maybe he'll listen to, a, to this uh, later on. Or maybe, you know. All right, let's see. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get the Super Chat in a question. Um, all right, uh, Corey says, Corey said, I got it right. That's good. <laughs> um, one of the things that Americans should really be worried about is this idea that uh, the U.S. is watching. Congress would love to regulate social media. Democrats and Republicans. Remember how hostile uh, uh, Cruz and, uh, and Hawley and other Republicans were to Facebook and Twitter. They would love to find ways to get in there and start regulating social media. And they're watching Australia. They're watching to see how it goes down. They're watching to see how the social media reacts. They're watching to see if they cave or they don't. They're watching to see how the people respond, whether there's a backlash from the people or not. So people are watching. And the American legislature is watching. You know, so this commentator on, on, uh, in the Washington Post says, uh, you know, 
she actually wants the government to start subsidizing. Here's, here's, a, here's an act that Representative, uh, let's see, Ann Kirkpatrick, a Democrat from Arizona, has put together called the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. Local Journalism Sustainability Act. The Buggy Industry Sustainability Act, which would give tax credits for local newspaper subscriptions. Free Press, a grassroots nonprofit that focused on media policy, has proposed a tax on micro-targeted advertisement, Google-like advertisement, Facebook-like advertising, with the proviso that the funds raised would go to support local news. So, and she says there's much creative work to be done on this fund. Creative work to take my money and give it to local news, their favorite pet project, their favorite news organization that represents their politics. No, government should stay out of the news business completely. I still find it mind-boggling that in spite of the Republicans having the Senate, the House, and the President for many of the last 20 years, the government still subsidizes PBS and NPR in the United States. We still have public government radio. It's just shocking that the government funds any media. But that's how weak Republicans are. That's how pathetic they are, that they can't even get rid of something like that. <sighs> when they were in the opposition in the House, they kept passing bills that defunded NPR and PBS. And as soon as they got into power and could actually do something about it, just like with Obamacare, they folded. All a question of the moral high ground. Republicans have granted the moral high ground to the left. And the left slowly is granting them all high ground to the woke nuts, to the far left. All right. Um, so watch for much, much, much more regulation of social media from all governments. All governments. Australians seem to be leading the way on this one, although the French, of course, have already done a little bit of this. And the European Union will probably get this done before the U.S. does. Let's see. Okay. Um, I wanted to make a quick comment in the context of, of, of co cancel culture, in the context of critical race theory, in the, in the context, uh, in this wide context that is going on right now, uh, about racism. Because everybody's being accused of racism. Racism is just thrown about by the left primarily, constantly, about anybody who disagrees with them about anything. It's gotten to the point where the term means nothing the way they are using it. But I think it's an important term. I think it's an important term because it captures something really essential. And I think it's an important term because properly understood, it demonstrates that the way the left is behaving and using the term racism makes them racists. Racism is the act of judging a person not based on his character, not based on his qualities, not based on who and what he is, but based on the insignificant characteristics of skin color, or ethnic background, or genetic makeup, when that is irrelevant, when that is irrelevant. So viewing whites in a particular way, not particular whites, based on their particular character and their particular characteristics, but talking about whites is racist. Talking about blacks is racist. I mean, treating them as members of a group rather than as individuals. So the whole critical race theory is a racist theory. The whole idea that we are determined by our so-called race, as if there was such a thing, 
is racist. Now there's, you know, if you're black and part of the middle class or maybe you're black and a conservative, then they call you white because your views are white views. They associate views with color of skin. They want to cancel the study of Greece and Rome. Not because they don't like the ideas. They're not complaining about the ideas of Greece. They're complaining about the fact that Greeks were white. The idea that there's white math, these are racist views. They need to be called out as racist views. These are abhorrent, disgusting. And these people should be canceled by civilized society. So when I use racist, and I hope when you use racist, it denotes the treating of an individual or of a group of individuals, not based of, of, of assigning an individual some kind of group characteristic and ignoring, ignoring their character. Again, with the canceling your own, yes, I, I don't understand. If you have the power to inflict pain on them, then they, I wish we had the power to cancel them in a sense of they should be fired. They're not academics. They're not worthy of the term academic. They, they should not be teachers at universities. These people should be kicked out of universities for the garbage, trash that they are teaching. So that is consistent with canceling, I think. Now, maybe somebody will write to me and tell me I'm wrong, but that seems to be the right. Now, we don't have the power to do that, so we can't cancel them, but I wish we could. It can't be that cancel culture can only, it can only refer, even in theory, only to the left. No, it, it, it refers to a phenomenon that could be, that could anybody, if they had the cultural power, could participate in. What the hell are some of you talking about? I don't know. All right, let's do some of these... Uh, some of these um, Super Chats. AOC wants Como Sculp. It's a beautiful thing. Calling for congressional hearing, hearing for cover-up of the 16,000 nursing home deaths due to COVID. She hopes to leverage this for her New York Senate run for Chuck Schumer's seat. Any thoughts on her gambit? I mean, good for AOC. Uh, I, 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 anybody who wants, who calls for Andrew Como to be investigated to be, to be kicked out of office, to be replaced, to force him to resign, is a good thing. It's a good thing. I don't think AOC could win a Senate race against Chuck Schumer. I, I don't think she could. It'd be interesting to watch. I look forward to seeing that primary. It could be fun. But I don't think she can beat Chuck Schumer. I really don't. Um, but I hope Chuck Schumer comes out in support of getting rid of Andrew Cuomo. I, I, unfortunately, I don't think he will because, you know, they're both mainstream Democrats and they're going to have each other's backs. So I am happy to see Andrew Cuomo squirm. I'm happy to see Democrats attacking each other. I'm happy to see the left splinter, fight, argue. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is for the, less to, the left to coalesce around one agenda, around one mission. Unfortunately, they have um, the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Thank you, Donald Trump. So uh, it's a... Um, 
it's great to see the, inf the infighting. That would be my perspective on this. And Andrew Cuomo is a really bad guy. And he should pay a cost for his criminal um, mismanagement of COVID in New York State. I am crazy to think this is a good thing that, I guess I, you're asking, am I crazy to think this is a good thing that the left has control to push their atrocious ideas to the extreme and burn themselves out? Just hope they are principled free market capitalists left to pick up the pieces afterwards. I mean, yeah, there's a sense in which, yeah, let the crazy, nutty uh, left, let them get it out there. I want them to tell us exactly what they want to do to this country, exactly what the consequences are going to be. I want them to articulate exactly how high the taxes are going to be, what companies they're going to break up, how, you know, uh, how they're going to inflict their ideas on our values and our lives. And let, let's have it out there in, in plain view of the American people. Because I think that if that was what was up for vote, they would lose. The only reason Biden won is because Biden distanced himself for that. Now, you might believe he won't govern that way or he will govern that way. I, I, I don't know. But he distanced himself from the far left because everybody knows that the far left is not electable. This is why I don't think AOC can win New York over Chuck Schumer. I don't think, um, I mean, the only way Sanders could win an election is if he was running against Trump. Because I think they both appeal to the same, to, to many of the same people, um, at least a, a subgroup that overlaps between them. But I don't think Sanders could win at, with any other Republican. And I, I just don't think the far left is in a position yet to win and that their ideas would be accepted by the American people. So this is why Biden, right? Now, whether the Republican Party can recover from the last four years to win an election again anytime soon is hard to tell. And certainly, are there any free market capitalists? I don't know who they would be. Who it would be? Um, is your run not progressing on its chosen topics? No, I've covered all the topics I wanted. I did Facebook blocking. Australian news, I did racism, and I did wrong on cancel culture. I did all of that. So I'm doing super chat questions now. What do you think of so bad it's good entertainment, such as Plan 9 and from Outer Space or The Room? Why do some people seem to love it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't get it. Um... And I know well, I know people who love it. You know, I know people who love this kind of this stuff. But I don't get it. I I don't like it, um, and I don't see the value. And I don't think what you can see in the value, right? So he says, canceling is a cultural purge. Yeah, I'm not against cultural purges, as long as they're not violent. But I'm not against f firing a lot of people <laughs> from our universities today. So I'm, I don't think it's good that bad is popular. I, I, I think it might be funny, it might be funny as an inside joke for people who know that it's bad and understand why it's bad. But I don't understand the, 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 why it becomes such a cultural thing. I don't know what it is that it's appealing to. I, I never got it, and I've, I haven't watched these movies, so I don't know. I saw a CNN article talking about a proposal to tax each, tax each trade on the stock market. I believe it was 1.1% tax on each trade on top of capital gains tax. I believe this will affect small-time investors most have you seen it? Yeah, I mean, this is a proposal that's been circulating for many years. It, it, every time a Democrat, I think even Republicans at a time, supported it, um, it's, it's a great revenue generator. 
it's very popular because it, it supposedly is going after Wall Street and who can be against going after Wall Street. Uh, the assumption is always that the, that the, uh, the, the people who paid are the, are the big guys. And it is mostly the big guys because they're the ones who trade the most. Um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's an it's a easy way to generate a lot of revenue for the government. And this is why I can't remember which politician, it was Elizabeth Warren or who it was, that really made this a big part of their campaign. And Biden has spoken positively about it. But it's very unlikely that it will pass. Uh, it's the, 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 just think of it this way. Um, it's, it's not something that Wall Street wants. This would be devastating for Wall Street. Reduced volumes in trade, uh, you know, and it, it, it would not be good for Wall Street. Wall Street is, they're the, they're the funders of the Democratic Party. I mean, they will let certain things pass. And higher taxes on the rich is something that the rich is always allowed for. But taxing their actual activity in the stock market I just don't think they would allow that to pass. I, 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 even somebody like Schumer is going to be hesitant to um, vote for that because he has to get elected in Manhattan. And he can't afford to lose the investment bankers' support, the money, and ultimately the votes. So you have to think about the politics of these things. A lot of these proposals put out. Economically, it's horrific. Economically, it would reduce the efficiency of the market. It would reduce the amount of trading in the market. Um, and it would not be it would not be a good phenomenon. It would raise a lot of money for the government, and that's why they love it. Um, all right, um, super chat is good. Uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more questions. Uh, if you want to use super chat, go ahead. Uh, don't forget before you leave to like the show. Just a thumbs up. It helps a lot on the, uh, uh, on the part of uh, the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm. Don't forget, of course, to share whatever you can from the channel. And don't forget to support the show on your own book show dot com slash support. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's what makes this possible to do this show. It what makes it possible for me to spend the time researching things like what's going on in Australia with Facebook and uh, so that you don't have to bother with all that stuff. It's what makes it possible for me to figure out what's going on with the New York Times and all that stuff that we did Saturday. Um, so, uh, Scott says, Wall Street is afraid of cancer culture mob too. Sure, to up to a point, they're afraid, not to the point where they're going to endorse a tax that has the potential to kill a big chunk of their business. I just don't think it'll happen. Uh, Brownie asked, do you think you're being shadow banned? You really should use Super Chat. I, I really should ignore you. But yeah, in a sense, I, you know, shadow banning means that the algorithm does not promote your work quite as much as it would otherwise. It promotes other people's work more. It, yeah, I mean, there's no question. My content is controversial. It's radical. It's out of the mainstream. And YouTube has no vested interest to promote it. Uh, above and beyond people who are more mainstream. I, I don't think that's the main reason why my subscriptions are not much higher than they are. I think the main reason for that is the fact that I piss so many people off and they, and they drop the subscription. I get a lot of people subscribing, but a lot of people are unsubscribe all the time. So it's not a matter of a, getting the word out there. A lot of people get the word out there, but I have a lot of unsubscribers. And the reason is they don't like the ideas. They don't like what I say. Um, I also think that, you know, I also think that YouTube does suppress stuff, uh, but it doesn't, uh, again, it's not the main reason why subscriptions are low. It's, it's the, 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 the reason is people unsubscribe and the reason is the ideas are just too radical. And, and, I have a particular style that doesn't appeal to people. I know a lot of objectivists. Most of the objectivists don't listen, you know, for whatever reason. 
luckily, you like the style. I got 200,000 views, over 200,000 views on Lex Friedman's show. I got, I've got, you know, my debate at Yale has half a million views or over half a million views on the Federalist website, maybe 400,000 or something, and then another 100,000 on my website. Uh, my, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, uh, Dave Rubin interview has 400,000 or something. So we've got the exposure but they're not coming and subscribing. Or if they do come to subscribe, they subscribe for a little while and they leave. It's just the way it is. Uh, okay, how long do you, th do you give the New York Times before it self-destructs and becomes obsolete? I don't know. I mean, it's hard to tell. First, they're making a lot of money. So uh, they're very profitable. Um, they have an audience. There's nobody, as I said, they still have journalists in the field. Nobody else really has journalists in the field. And um, thank you, BBT Boy MN, who says he found me from the Lex Pod. I really appreciate you being here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, and a lot of people are here because of the Lex Pod. Um, I hope you stay. I hope you read Ayn Rand. I hope you get engaged with the ideas. So I don't know how long it takes before the New York Times self-destructs. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be a while. I don't think these things happen quickly. I think it, it's going to happen slowly and again. Very profitable. So it's got the capital to keep going. Is being a loner immoral? Inconsistent with egoism because genuine happiness only comes from connections with other human beings. I, well, I don't know that that's genuine happiness only comes from. I don't think that's true. I think genuine happiness becomes from attaining your values, uh, your pro-life values, your pro-happiness values, and uh, from attaining them. And I, I think that other people are crucial for many of those values. Many of those values cannot be attained with other, without other people. Romantic love, for example, is a value cannot be attained from other people. Daniel says he found me through George Gammon. Yeah, I got a lot of followers from George Gammon interview. Those, the interviews generally that I do are how I get a lot of people. Um, so, um, I do think that, I don't think you can say being a loner is immoral. Because, you know, it depends on that individual's values, what's happened to them in their lives, what kind of interactions they've had with other people. It's quite possible that the interactions they've had with other people are so negative that their life is actually the best for them, for their life, is to be a loner. That is the exception of the rule. For most people, egoism, part of egoism is contact with other people. Contact with civilization. But I'm not going to say that for every human being, in every, certainly not in every circumstance, it is contextual. Right? It is contextual. So it's not always, it doesn't, it's not necessarily immoral. It's not necessarily inconsistent with egoism. Right? It depends on what your options are. All right. Uh, do you give Reagan credit for the Soviet Union collapse? If Jimmy Carter had won a second term, would the Soviet Union have collapsed in the 80s? I mean, I give him a little bit of credit for the Soviet Union's collapse, for, for the fact that it collapsed when it did. I don't give him overwhelming credit because I think the Soviet Union collapsed for the reasons Ayn Rand said it would collapse, and that is because it was a failure. It was self-destructive. It had to self-implode, which is what it did. I think Ronald Reagan's moral stand with solidarity with regard to Poland, calling the Soviet Union the evil empire, I think those things had a real impact on the fall of the Soviet Union. I don't think what conservatives usually cite which is the arms race. I don't think the arms race had as big of an impact as the moral kind of arguments that Reagan made and the fact that the Soviet Union was ready to collapse anyway. It was an empty shell and it was, it was ready to collapse. 
Uh, but I do think the moral arguments that he made, I think the bully pulpit makes a big difference. A big difference. I don't think, for example, China would have taken Hong Kong. Basically, it's taken control of Hong Kong. I don't think China would have done that if Trump would have stood up to them properly on Hong Kong and, and used it as a, a moral bully pulpit against them. If he'd sided with the demonstrators and argued against the, the, communist, uh, the, the, the communist Party taking control of Hong Kong, I, I, I think that the Chinese would have backed off. But they got nothing from the U.S. The U.S. was silent. That only emboldened them. And then COVID happened, and then they could do whatever they wanted. They could get away with anything because everybody was too distracted. How is it that materially life is so good while spiritually we couldn't be more primitive, nihilistic, and miserable? Well, don't speak for everybody. Um, I think because there's still a spirit, a production of, 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 of self-improvement, of uh, a challenge, of trying to succeed, of value or orientation. You know, as much as you guys hate Silicon Valley, when you go to Silicon Valley, you don't get primitive, nihilistic, and miserable. You get dyma dynamic, value-seeking, energetic, and yeah, horrifically mistaken philosophically. The Enlightenment is not dead. The Enlightenment is still ongoing. It gets weaker and weaker as we move into the future. So the elements within society that are primitive, nihilistic, and miserable keep growing. But there is definitely another culture. If you go to Austin, Texas, it's a vibrant, exciting place that primarily is driven by a vibrant, exciting tech community. It's where the action is. It's young people still motivated by improving their lives and by discovering new things and by doing cool stuff. That's all good. So we're not spiritually dead yet. We're slowly dying. And there's still an element of enlightenment spirit that is fighting back. It's inconsistent and it's weak. Did Tui try to cancel Rourke in the Fountainhead? I think he did, particularly given that he had the power to do it. And he had the media behind him. And he had the equivalent of social media. And he had, he had the culture behind him. So it was, he was trying to cancel Rourke in the Fountainhead. He failed, but he certainly was trying. List the market reasons why a news corporation would want to share their articles with Facebook. Yeah, I mean, one, Facebook pays them. Two, they get massive exposure to, to hundreds of millions of people around the world for their news stories. And then hopefully encourage those people to come to their website ultimately. And on their website, they can sell advertising. Three, they can sell some content. They can provide some free content to Facebook for distribution to get the word out there to the world uh, about their news organization. And then once people come to their website, they can try to sell them subscriptions. So there are lots of reasons why a news corporation would want to share their articles with Facebook. And certainly they want to be in Google. You don't exist if you're not on Google. All right. When you say we don't have the power, is that akin to when the left says oppressed groups can't be racist? Yeah, that is because they lack power in society. No, because I think to cancel someone assumes that you can cause them ill. Again, it's not physical ill, not physical violence, but you can cause other people to behave badly towards them in a sense of firing them, in a sense of never speaking to them, in a sense of not buying their books. But if you just say, oh, this person's a bad person, and everybody goes, nah, okay, who cares? Then you haven't canceled them. You have no... Levitt, so I, no, I don't think, I don't think it's the same as, uh, as people saying you can only be racist if you're in the majority group. No, because racism, its definition is not about power. Can cancel culture, whole es essence is about 
power. And it's not even just about loss of reputation. There are lots of people who lose reputation. It's about loss of access. Did you hear a response to the narrative that the Texas power outage was a result of deregulation and puts profit above people? I did not respond to it. I've heard of it. Uh, it requires a bigger response than I would give it over Super Chat. But yes, I've heard that. It's outrageous. It's wrong. Maybe I can get Alex Epstein on the show to talk about, um, uh, to talk about uh, the Texas power outages. I'll, I'll talk to him and see if he's willing to come on. And maybe we'll do it this week. When watching Westerns, do you ever root for the Indians? Some films show them as hostiles. Others show victims of U.S. brutality like Little Big Man. Um, yeah, sometimes I, root, I could root for the Indians when, when the movie is done well and it does show them as victims of U.S. brutality. And in some cases, there certainly were cases where the Indians were victims of, of, of brutality. You know, in many cases, they were the aggressors. In many cases, the violence against them in some sense was inevitable. But in many cases, it was horrific what was done for them and unjust what was done for them. So yes, I, I do think one can sympathize with them when the movie is positioned right. And again, I, I don't have to agree with the point of view of a movie to like the movie. You know, you can watch a movie about an environmentalist activist and it's a good movie, and, and the activist is portrayed as having good character and courageous and brave, and, 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 and that's good, even though you don't agree with the message that the movie's trying to convey. So you can enjoy a movie without agreeing with its message. Uh, let's see. Have you ever seen the show The Americans about Soviet sleeper agents during the 80s? I did. I, I watched like two seasons of it, it was very well done. But I couldn't root for them. I, 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 I couldn't care enough for them. I, I wanted them to fail. And it, it went to counter. So it was ineffective in that sense. Uh, even in the way they're portrayed, there was nothing in the movie that could convince me that I should switch sides. It should be on their side. And therefore, I lost interest in it. What do you think of... Intel but it's very well made. What do you think of intentional racial diversity in casting and entertainment? Some of it bothers me. And sometimes in cases like Sesame Street or Star Trek, it seems proper. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind it. I mind that it's done through quotas or something. But I commented in the show, and I forget the name of the show now, that is set in, in, in you know, a, a fictionalized 19th century England, and half the characters are black and half are white, and um, race is not an issue. Nobody comments on the fact, oh, why are you a duke and you're black? There were no dukes, you know. Um, it's just you're a duke. Who cares whether you're white or black? I, and I like that. I certainly like it in Star Trek, because it's a future in which we are colorblind. And I like it in Sesame Street because it's, it's, it's educational to put in a world where racism exists to portray colorblindness. I wonder if, if, uh, if Sesame Street is still politically correct. Bridgerton or something like that was the name of the series in the 19th century. So I like the effort to portray colorblindness. And I think that, you know, uh, another show that did it Oh, what was the show that did it recently? I saw this. Um, I forget now, but it's, it'll come to me. I forget it. But it's not politically correct anymore to be colorblind. It's not politically correct anymore to be colorblind. You know, the whole anti-racist, modern anti-racist movement, the whole white fragility is not about colorblindness. So I embrace any attempt to, to, to bring about colorblindness, even if it's somewhat jarring because it sets it in a historical context where you wouldn't expect it. I'm trying to think what the show was that I saw that 
Yeah, I can't. I don't know. I'm finishing a PhD in philosophy and considering writing a book about the virtue of productivity. Would intellectual celebration, recognition of productiveness be helpful for rational progress? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, I mean, a book on the virtue of productivity would be fantastic. A culture that celebrates productiveness is a culture we can get to. It's a culture we can save. It's a culture worth saving, and it's a culture that can be saved. So it's a culture that we can move forward with. So, um, I would definitely encourage you to pursue this, uh, you know, even if it's a part of kind of Aristotelian virtue ethics. But, but I, absolutely, a culture that focuses on individual productiveness, individual productivity is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a good, good, good thing uh, and helps us a lot, moves us a lot. Okay, let's see. Thank you, everybody. I think we're done. Uh, I appreciate all the support from the Super Chatters. I appreciate all of you who support the show monthly. If you want to join them by supporting the show, you can do so on yourownbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon, on Subscribestar, on Locals, on any one of those platforms. Um, you can support. The monthly support is incredibly valuable because I can easily predict it. It's, it's, I can plan based on it. I know that the money is coming in on a monthly basis, on a regular basis. Please don't forget to like the show before you leave. Uh, don't forget to uh, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not a subscriber already. Uh, don't forget to share it with your friends if you think there's any potential for any of them to be interested in these ideas and maybe become a subscriber. So please, as you leave, as we shut down, please press that like button. I will see you all probably on Wednesday, maybe tomorrow. We will see. This week is a little bit... Difficult, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. 